Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Grow Great Live. I'm Ria Lala, and I've got Antonia Dodge and Marianna Pollock with me. And today we are talking about a really fascinating subject. In today's Down and Dirty, we are going to talk about discipline. And it's something that's near and dear to every parent's heart. How do I discipline my child in a way that doesn't feel like we're being the Wicked Witch of the East and they still learn the lesson? So I'm so excited to jump right into this. Let's start with Antonia. Antonia, tell me. Tell me a little bit about your discipline style and what you think about discipline. Well, uh, first of all, I just want to indicate that this is one of those incredibly brave moments. It, it, when you share your discipline techniques with another parent, the assumption is that you're going to get massively dogpiled because people have such an emotional attachment to what is the right and wrong way to discipline. Uh, there's been plenty of books written about how you never, ever, ever physically assault your child through spankings. And there's been plenty of books about how if you don't do that, your kid won't be well adjusted. Like there's so much emotional attachment to how we should be disciplining our children. And that makes it, uh, it, it makes it for me at least, an uncomfortable topic to even address. So I'll just be radically honest and say, I'm not super, I'm not super comfortable sharing it, but by the same token, I also recognize that it's gotta be shared. It's something that has to be discussed and talked about because it's it's an area which I think that we all feel judged. And a lot of times, because we feel judged on it, we'll hand the power of our disciplining technique over to the culture. We'll hand the power of what we believe is the right way to discipline. We won't honor that. We'll hand it over to what we think we're going to be judged on or not judged on, which in and of itself, I believe, is a confusing message to the child. We're going to be inconsistent if our disciplining style is catering to other people as opposed to coming from what authentically within. So even though I'm not totally comfortable talking about it, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and yes, we want to hear yeah, yeah. what is it? <laughs> so, so I have a personal theory. Okay. And I'm not going to go too deep a dive on this. I actually talk about this in one of my programs on children and family. And that is we have different time periods where we're imprinting different things in our minds as we get older. And in fact, they've they've studied when the brain is open to a new imprint. And an imprint is something that gets imprinted. Think of it as branded on your brain and you carry it with you for the rest of your life unless you go back and try to re-imprint your mind, which takes some skills, some, you know, some actual techniques. So there are different ages in which different imprints are happening. And one of the reasons why discipline, in my opinion, is so difficult and confusing is that the same discipline that is appropriate for a certain Im one imprinting time is a completely wrong discipline for a different imprinting time. So it's actually well, that the discipline needs to change over time, or at least I believe so. And so there's a certain time period where it's called the bio survival time period where, where kids are just trying to figure out whether or not the universe is a friendly or hostile place. And in that time period, if you physically assault your children, it's going to give them the impression that the universe and the world is very hostile versus another imprint. And that's bio survival happens when they're actually actually breastfeeding. It's when they're babies, when they're infants. And then if you graduate, what they do is they naturally graduate to a second imprinting time, which is called the, the anal territorial or the dominance time period. Now they're trying to figure out who's in charge. And in this time period, if you physically dominate them, it actually sends them messages that there is a hierarchy. So that doesn't necessarily mean you have to hit your child or spank them, but you do have to send the message that you are above them in the hierarchy. And in that way, they understand that they're not the person who's in charge all the time. And that actually is a comforting feeling because we naturally actually come with Rhea had mentioned in the the one hour that we did on the subject of children in charge that there's a hierarchy that children feel comfortable with and it is not them in charge so if you physically dominate your children and that doesn't again that doesn't have to be spankings but you let them know no I'm the person who's in charge and that means I'm going to be taking care of you physically which means if somebody comes at you I'm the person who's going to stand between you and them that makes them actually feel very a lot more settled but if you physically dominate that same place in the bio survival time period it actually makes them think that the world is hostile so you over time changing your discipline style is actually good for their imprinting what are you gonna say Rhea? so i just want to pick mm -hmm. up on something you said for our listeners mm -hmm. they might be a bit confused about what you are talking about when you say physical dominations Can sure you just what you're talking about? So it can be spanking, as in I am the person who has the ability to spank you. Uh, my personal theory is that spankings are reserved for time periods where they are making actions that could literally kill them. 
and, but they don't have the ability to connect those two things. So my, my daughter is two and a half years old and she doesn't have the long range thinking ability to understand that if she runs into a road, she could get killed. So I trim tab that for her or I create an imprint in her mind that running out in the road is not okay. And if she runs out in the road, she's going to get swatted on her, on, on her butt. And so in that way, I create a, an immediate imprint or an immediate relationship between running in the road and physical pain. And, and I've chosen to do that. Now, not everybody's comfortable with that. There are other forms of physical domination, which is that I'm going to I'm going to force you to sit in the corner and you cannot leave that corner. And if you do, I'm just going to keep pushing you there. I'm going to keep putting you there, which is what I reserve for other time periods. Like if she dis, if she disobeys me and it's not life threatening, then she gets a she'll she'll get a timeout and she can't leave that spot. Now, I know that not everybody's comfortable with that either. There's different styles of that. But in this time period where she's trying to understand dominance, that's what I've chosen to do. Now, when she gets older, she's going to be out of that imprint time and she's no longer going to be const constantly trying to figure out who's dominant. She's going to be in a time period of learning. It's called the um, the time binding time period or when they figure out how the world works. And in that time period, and that usually happens around the age of about six or seven, um, maybe even sometimes earlier, five to seven, they, in they exit the time period of dominance and enter a time period where they're trying to figure out how the world works. And in that time period to physically dominate them is sometimes very unhealthy because they'll get this imprint that the world is out to get them. So the thing that makes discipline very complicated, I think, is that, or at least for me, and how I've had to try to figure out a series of, you know, d forms of discipline. And when I use the word discipline, I specifically don't mean punishment. It's not punitive. It's not that I'm angry with you, and so I'm going to let you know how angry I am. It's that there's consequences to actions, and I'm trying to express this in a world that will not be patient with you if I'm not around. So so it's it. I, I've actually chosen to change it, but the one thing that remains consistent through all of it is that every time I discipline her, if it's, you know, trying to help her understand that the world is a friendly place and not hostile, if it's that I'm above her in the hierarchy and she's lower, or if it's during the time period where she'll be entering, which is how the world works on a, on like a, um, on a belief level, the entire time everything gets done with a very calm tonality, very much in love, very connective. I explain what's going on, even if she doesn't have the language yet to understand it, but it's a calm space. My voice is calm. I'm connected emotionally with her. When the discipline is over, I hold her and let her know that I love her and that this is not done in anger at all. So no matter what form of discipline I take in different time periods, it is always with connection. It is always with love. It is always with me in a calm space. So this is not punitive. I'm not angry. I'm not letting you know that when you make me angry, now I get to hurt you or punish you or do something bad. It's that I can't allow this behavior to happen. It's going to be it will be um, dangerous for you to continue. So I need to make a quick association between this behavior and something that you don't like because you can't see the timeline long enough. So that's my d discipline style. And I know that not everybody's going to be down with that, but that's the theory that I've come from. Got it. Mariana. Cool. Um, what I was wondering myself um, after I became a mother, um, I knew that, you know, the discipline is in place. Obviously, we all went through that. And um, where do I get that? How do I decide what's best? And what I've noticed with myself and a lot of other parents that I've, you know, observed, including my own, is that um, it's their own, it's our own perception as parents. What do we want and or what do we don't want, depending on the filter that you have in your brain. So um, when you discipline your child and from the point of what do I want is, um, do I want for my child to be a representative um, member of our family? I want him to grow up or her to grow up to be a valued member of society. Um, I want them to, you know, have a family. I want them to stay clear of, you know, any drugs or alcohol, anything like that. Um, from the perspective of, you know, what I don't want my child to do is literally for more, most parents, I don't want my child to end up in jail. So I will do anything I can. I will, you know, impose any kind of discipline that is possible for my parent, for my child to not end up in jail or not be this or not be that or, you know. Um, so setting um, discipline, um, it's, it's not easy. You know, there are different ways of doing it out there. And um, for a lot of people can look differently at that and even judge other people on how they do it. Um, I agree with Antonia that as they progress, from the moment they open their eyes and they don't understand anything, you know, to start toddling around and running into things or running into the street, um, to, you know, starting school, what's acceptable in school, what it's not, you know, all the way to teenage years and ultimately, you know, once they're off to college, um, being aware of what's needed in a certain time 
of their lives in a certain period of their lives, I think it's crucial. Um, so what can work for, you know, uh, when they were a toddler, it's definitely not going to work when they're eight on, or when they're 13. Um, I'm also a big proponent on talking to children um, as much as possible, f getting to the bottom of, you know, what is happening. Um, and um, um, did I spank my kid, you know, once or twice? Um, yes, I did when he ran onto the street again because he needs to know that in that moment it's like you kind of you know have to shake him and have him understand that that's totally unacceptable because it's better if I shake him a little bit than you know um, car you know running over him um, so I think it's a very interesting topic where um, a lot of people are going to agree or disagree but I would imagine whatever it's best for you and whatever however you see yourself and your children um, you just pick from there yeah, it really is an interesting topic. It comes up a lot uh, when I'm speaking to parents. And discipline, I feel like I have a, a very different slant on how I approach discipline from, from a young age. Because we don't actually live in a world where the kids are always running onto the street, right? That is the once in a blue moon where the kids run into a street. And in that moment, you're absolutely right. And I, I hear you, Antonia. In that moment, the child needs to know that there is a there is an immediate danger and it has to, but that can also be conveyed in my mind in if mommy's voice is in a pitch and an elevation and a sternness, that same whatever fear that we're trying to create in the child, because right at that moment in time, they can't reason if I run onto the road, they're gonna get hit. That pitch, that tone, that look uh, can still be conveyed without actually um, giving the child a tap. That's that's my perspective on it. now. I, I say all this growing up in a household that didn't have much discipline. Uh, we were allowed to throw balls in the house and we were allowed to do whatever the heck we wanted to do. And I often tell my husband, how bad did I turn out if we grew up without any discipline? We were allowed to do almost anything we wanted. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying that that's the way to do it. However, this is the mindset I take with discipline. And I don't think it changes from 2 to 13 to 22. And it's this. It's that at every moment in time, any moment, so we're going to just think of things that happen through like a chunk of time. So when your kids are somewhere between two and five, they might uh, pull things down, they might throw something down, they might push a kid, they might hit somebody. When they go from, I don't know, five to ten, then they might be, uh, they get angry and they break something, or they, they push their sister, or they scream something that they shouldn't, like I hate you, or something. So let's just work with that, that age group, right? Um, something has been done where the behavior needs to be changed and we want our role is to guide them. So that's what discipline is doing, is guiding them to the correct behavior. And in the guidance of the correct behavior, can I convey to that child without removing them? Yeah? And I'm not, I mean, you guys have made a very good point, like made it very clear that you never separate from the child and you are, your tone is always loving and connected. So that, I think, is amazing because I think that you can have that but that requires something really big when we're disciplining and that is the ability for the parent to regulate their own emotions when something just like all oh, your drapes just pulled down or they just punched your you know their sister in the face mm -hmm. for you to check yourself mm -hmm. think about calm yourself down yeah. do that whole sex process the feeling and then show up where you're not screaming yelling and like automatically hitting and the thing is that's the issue is that mm -hmm. If that piece is missing from the puzzle, then discipline is going to be much harder to achieve mm -hmm. in a way that is nourishing and actually serves to what it's supposed to be doing, which is the guide. So that is the first part for sure, is how does a parent go through their own self-regulation where they go, I want to beat this child right now, or I want to give them a slap in their hiney and go, where do I have to go? How do I center myself? And there's a way that you can process your emotions, and it really involves going into your body and being still. And there's, 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 you know, there's things that you can do. But the next part is, okay, now it comes time where I'm calm, but I have to discipline the child. You know, there have been studies. I mean, right now we have all different types of listeners, and some people use timeouts to send their children to a timeout. You need to go sit on the stairs. You need to go into your room and calm down. I'm a big proponent on to completely eradicate timeouts. I don't believe in them personally. I believe in something called a time in. And when I say timeout is if you take monkeys, and you separate the monkey from the tribe for any length of time, like for a length of time, the monkey goes insane. 
if you take a um, if you take a child and or in fact just look at how we even abide by rules and regulations we abide by rules and regulations because there's a law and if we don't follow the law then we're going to go to jail right there's going to be or we're going to pay a big fine so there's something there that's punitive that has us do something in order to stay between all the checks and balances so I, I don't believe in removing a child ever what I believe is if the child is done something that you makes your skin crawl in that moment you do your self-regulation and then you find the wherewithal if you have to pull from your baby toe to sit down with them and hold their hands so that you're doing I don't even call it timeout you're doing the time in together where you're saying hand in hand we're going to be in the trenches together and and that so your child at least has the ability to calm their system down so you can lead with logic because so we already talked about when they're hijacked they can't think logically you can't explain you can't use logic why did you throw it down you know it's not right to hit your sister that won't even land for them because in their world they thought it was perfectly logical for them to punch the sister in the face or for them to kick your car or they're mad and they pull down the drapes so that's not a teachable moment the teachable moment comes when the child is calm and feeling receptive to you and not resentful so how do we keep the child feeling resentful to us we sit with them. We are in the trenches holding their hands saying, okay, in this house we don't punch sisters. That's not part of our value system or that's not, that's not what we do. We don't hit. I'm not even going to go into logic about what we need to do. We need to use our words because in that moment they can't understand to use their words. And it doesn't matter if they're 10 or 22. When you're hijacked, you're not thinking with your higher thinking brain. Your prefrontal cortex is just blocked out. So in that moment, just stay with them and get their system to calm down and then when they're calm and their, their sobbing goes like this and they're finally calm then you strategize and you go hey you know what I can tell you were really angry and I can tell that that must have been why you pulled everything down let's brainstorm together how else can you let you know your sister know that you're upset how else can you let mom know that you don't like what she did let's brainstorm and now they feel like you're their ally as opposed to you're this. And I think that you can still have that while maintaining the hierarchy. So that's that's what I always recommend as the first. Now, I don't say that lightly. This is hard stuff. This is where we do the work. This is where everything culminates together for us to be in our best self in that moment. And does it happen all the time? No, because sometimes you scream at the kids and sometimes you might hit the kids or sometimes you might do something that's un suboptimal. And when we miss it, like we miss our cue, then we just don't go, oh, bad mommy, why did you do that? We just go, hey, you know what? We got to love it into submission. So that's where we say, what can I do next time? That's not how I want to be. That's not how I want to show up. What can I do next time that will allow me to find the, the mindset, the words, the, uh, the wherewithal to bring all my tools to bear in this moment? Mm -hmm. And... That's that's what I would share. Yes, yeah. Antonia. Well, and I I think that again the topic of discipline is really sensitive because I I think almost every parent feels judged on it. Like I think we can't help but feel judged um, with our discipline style, and so it it becomes difficult to make strong. And 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 then I mean my my background is in personality types, and so I recognize that there are certain personality types that certain strategies work beautifully on, and other personality types that they just couldn't give two shits about sitting down and talking with you. <laughs> like like it's all <laughs> visceral for them. And so one of the things that I think we have to balance is that. Like we're we're going to we're dealing with completely different situations with completely different personality types of both parents and child and the dynamic created between these personality types and then the component where we feel judged about how we're going to discipline. But I think no matter what style of discipline that we personally have determined is right for our kid, because we get I mean we get that we get to determine that. I think the number one thread that runs through all of it is, as you mentioned, self-regulate, like emotional regulation for yourself, teaching your child emotional regulation and making sure that you're coming at it from a responsive state, which is when we're responding instead of reacting, reacting is you pulled my curtains down and I'm pissed as hell and now I'm going to, I'm going to react to that. Mm -hmm. Responding is, okay, so the curtains just got pulled down and this requires from me to take at some form of action. So which action am I going to take? Just being able to hack yourself between those two things. Responding instead of reacting 
already I think that you are much further ahead of the game because then you can come with love as opposed to the punitive I'm punishing you now because you made me feel a certain way it's now it's course correction it's now discipline it's now making sure that you're re you're interacting with your child in a way where they understand that there are certain things that are okay and not okay and so regardless of what you have decided for yourself is your best discipline technique for your kid making sure that you're coming connected I think the time in concept is fantastic Rhea when you mentioned like it's not a timeout, it's a time in. You're connecting with your kid, you're in the trenches with them. If you're coming from effusive love and a desire for the child to course correct, I think whatever discipline and style that you have decided works best for you and your kid, you're you're not going to abuse them if you're coming from that space. You're not going to do something that is of permanent damage to the child. Well, no, I mean, you're going to do permanent damage to your kid because we all do. <laughs> we all do permanent damage to our kid and we've all had permanent damage done to us. And by permanent, I just mean something that follows us until we, until we review it later as adults but that said you're you're going to come from a space that they recognize is not about mom or dad is angry now and now oh crap I'm I'm in it right I've just stepped in it but rather what can we do to co-create this N never happening again if possible how can we co-create something that is going to be the right result for both of us and we can create a win-win if you come from that mentality over time I mean I, you're you're Mariana Ria you guys are coming from the time period of having um what between five and mariana how old are your kids again they're um eight and almost 13. okay and how old are your kids ria uh eight and six eight and six okay and so and i've got a two i've got somebody who's not quite two and a half so it i mean the the i was reading a book about um a criminal profilers that profile serial killers and they talk about the difference between mo or how they kill versus signature which is the one thing they consistently do and not that serial killer is a perfectly acceptable topic right now but there's a difference what we're talking about is different modes of discipline but the signature should remain the same always and that signature is that i'm with you i love you I want to course correct. I want to co-create something awesome, a win-win, and the signature should never change. The, si the uh, and and Rhea, you mentioned that the 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 mode can stay the same throughout all of that. That's entirely possible as well. But I think really what I think what you're talking about is signature. I could be wrong. Please. Please correct me if I am. But the signature is that I'm in it with you. That's the signature. The signature never changes, regardless of what the discipline. I'm curious and investigative in how I'm approaching it because right. one other tiny perspective change is having the parents do before they look at the child go what was it about me that mm -hmm. created this outcome right and I think that's much more useful than pointing blame at the child right because there's something that's in the house maybe the inability to set boundaries maybe the inability maybe you've been wishy-washy and now all of a sudden you're putting a hard foot down right and the child is then and it's really about yep. me and so if you if the if the pointing of the finger always looks back here. Mm -hmm. I find that's much more valuable, um, informative place to lead from than looking at the child as if oh, it's just like this demon child is behaving this way, or I've told them a million times. Exactly. You know. So, exactly. So if this. That's, that's still yeah. No, no, please, Mariana, go ahead. I was going to ask, um, actually not ask, but make a point because I'm hearing all these things and, and like it all comes to my mind for um, a quick and dirty um, tip, you know, mm -hmm. how can you know your child even better and make maybe, you know, make a discipline um, choices on that. Um, in relation to what you mentioned, um, Antonia, that the signature never changed, that is absolutely it. That's given. We come from that. That's on the, on the plate already. And then in relation to Ria, what you mentioned, um, that sometimes it doesn't have to be physical, it could be a voice, a, a tone of voice. And also in connection with what we talked about in our previous session about how to be present with your child and also knowing yourself, um, the more you know yourself, the more you're gonna know your child. And the more you're gonna know what's gonna work uh, for both of you and especially the child. Um, and uh, there are different, totally different perspectives, different programs that you can take, and it's all part of the self-development. Um, and I will imagine that uh, one of the quickest ways that you can um, you can use uh, you can quickest thing that you can use um, to discipline is just kind of know um, your child where do they come from the place of understanding and learning also because you know um, most of us know that we learn through you know through our three major you know more main main, main um, um, modality senses which is yeah. auditory yeah mm -hmm. um, auditory kinesthetic and visual mm -hmm. so uh, for the kinesthetic for the um, auditory kid, uh, children the tone of voice is gonna do it mm -hmm. that's it you know the tone of voice is changing my mom is getting higher pitch I better you know um, mm -hmm. straighten up 
Uh, for other people, visual actually. Visual would work really good for children, uh, meaning showing them um, real life or maybe a video of something that will be a consequence for an action, for an action or something like that. For the, for the kinesthetic children, you know, just kind of grabbing their hand a little bit tighter, you know, when you're crossing, um, crossing the street or, you know, when you try to get their attention, you know, or even just tapping them on the shoulder, hey, you mm -hmm. need to look at me. Um, I think knowing those kind of, uh, you know, modalities will make it so much easier for them because I can yell at my son as much as I want, it's never going to change. But right. if I show him that my face is changing, then he knows that it's time to listen. Um, and I realized that actually because he was outside and I was trying to, you know, um, call him to come home. He never, you know, responded because he just was so in the play. He didn't even hear me. Uh, but then it, when I caught him actually looking at me and I just said, you know, I just show him to come home, he immediately came and I said, oh, okay, so he is visual. So I'm going to use that with him. The other, my other son, totally kinesthetic. So for him, talking, showing doesn't really work. But if I, you know, just kind of gently take him by the shoulders and I say, look, listen to me, we got to talk about this. And I never leave, my, my hands never leave his body, leave his body, then, you know, he totally gets it. So, you know, I thought to offer mm -hmm. quick and dirty tips. I think that's really important, mm -hmm. you're right. And then parents, uh, you know, and there's lots of things you can find online, certainly in Grow Great Live, there'll be information on this, on how you can figure out whether or not, uh, or Grow Great Magazine, and how you can figure out whether your child is auditory, kinesthetic, or a visual learner. So mm -hmm. understanding those modalities, super important. Um, one thing that just kind of occurred to me as you were saying that, Mariana, is you know, for a lot of parents, the reason why they yell and the reason why they might spank is the argument they'll give is because it works. You know, they get the result. And more times than not, between yelling and arguing, you will get a result. Like if I beat my child enough, I will get a result, right? For sure. So beatings have to get hard enough. Or if I yell at them enough, they're going to get, you know, depending, they might, whether or how, depending on how seriously they take you you're going to get a result until you realize you're getting hoarse. So the question becomes then, okay, well, just because you're getting results doesn't mean that it's working. So I think it's really important where we step back and go, how do we really know if it's working? Because results that the child never goes near the fight, I mean, that the child doesn't punch your sister, that could have been because I beat them within an inch of their life and they have the fear of God in them. So how do we know it works? It still requires us constantly to be vigilant yeah. and to question mm -hmm. and to analyze and to self-introspect and to see whether, you know, whether the discipline even matches the punishment or why do I even have this? Am I bringing something ancient from what my father used to do or what my mother used to do? Or in my case, there's been no rules. So go ahead, throw the ball in the house. Right. I don't care. Right. <laughs> What's happening there? So that's always really important, important questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. And, you know, it's actually a really funny thing that we saw in the movie. We, uh, we've seen, uh, we went to see um, Exodus, the gods and kings. And um, as the Moses was um, riding um, through, the, um, through this um, slave uh, place that they, they had, um, one of them was whipping the slave and the slave was laughing. So um, the, Moses asked him, he said, so why is he laughing? Um, and uh, the person whipping said, he says he doesn't feel no pain. And then Moses just said, so why whip? And then he, you know, went away. So mm -hmm. finding what works and what's most effective, I think it's the, you know, what's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck, as Antonio always says. <laughs> well, and, and, and ecologically, like on a big scale, like taking in more territory, like, because it's a combination of what you said, Mariana, recognizing the personality type of your child, recognizing their modality, recognizing what works for them, combined with what's getting my immediate result, but that might not, I mean, it's winning the battle, but not the war. So it's a combination of recognizing what works with your kid and also zooming out enough to go, yeah, okay, well, it's working, but is it producing the characteristics that I want to see? Is it producing the kind of, like, is it the long-term plan? So I think it's a combination of the, I mean, that's why all of this is so sensitive. I think one thing that, I mean, I don't know if you guys agree with me, I think one thing that is very important, though, that parents recognize is that if you are making your discipline decisions based on feeling judged by other parents, you're starting from the wrong, like, that's the wrong starting line. Like, you have to feel freedom to be able to determine the right course of action as long, as long as the foundation is pure, unadulterated love. Like, like a strong, not just like a, not the selfish love, like everything is an act of love and it's maybe just an act of love toward myself. 
but seriously wanting your ch like absolutely and not just wanting what's best for your child but seeing a holistic picture what is the end game result that i want for my my child what kind of adult do i want them to be and so it's about building characteristics and if you start from with the end in mind and recognize their unique individuality, recognize that is what winning the battle is not the same as winning the war, and then also recognizing that you cannot be checking in with other parents all the time to determine like, well, I think spanking is wrong. Well, I think timeouts are wrong. Well, I think, you know, lecturing is wrong. I think that's not going to do it. Like, like, like you have to determine that. You really have to feel permission to do that on your own. Mm -hmm. And then, and starting from that basis, and I think, I think we do so much based on allowing other people's opinion of us to color how we behave. And that's still behaving reactionary. That's still reacting even if the parent, if another parent isn't judging you in the moment in your house, it's still reactionary. So coming from a responsive place, I think is very important. Yeah, and Agreed. that might be something that we talk about another time, but how does a parent, how does a parent do that? Where do they build the esteem and the trust in themselves such that they can, uh, you know, think objectively about all these different moving parts because there's a lot of pieces to this. It is. And, you know, and especially when we're thinking about how, you know, w what outcome do we want for our children where we kind of pan out and see if, see, because I, I get very nervous when we go, when we use the word love, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, we got to operate from a feeling of love. Well, right. I love my kid and therefore right, right. I'm doing this. Yeah, totally. My idea of love is going to be based on my, you know, my beliefs and my blind spots and right. my... Right. Yeah, exactly. Whatever. Right. So I, I, I tend to stay away from the word love <laughs> um, only because I'm beating my child because I love him. Right. I mean, I'm, I love him and I want him to grow up and learn these things. So I think that the part that I just want to highlight about what you said, Antonia, is where they're thinking about the 30,000 view, 30,000 foot view of where they want, the type of person that they want their children to be. Right. The 30,000 view of um, how do I grow? How do I develop myself? Mm -hmm. How do I ask questions and not just try and do it by myself? Right. Look at the people who you trust and love around you to give you feedback. Ask for the feedback because no one wants yeah. to give advice. Be the type of person who says, you know what, I'm really wanting to up my game. What do you see? Yeah. Is there any way? And do that with people that you know love you and give them permission yeah. to give you that feedback because that's what we want. We want our kids to be, I mean, my kids, for your kids, uh, I know Mariana for sure, are your accountability partners. They're telling you when to breathe and when to, you know, you're using a tone with me. So at that way you're in a nice feedback loop yeah. and our kids learn. Yeah. That's why it's a really great question to ask Ask the kids how they want how, to be disciplined. Yeah. Ask how, you know, what's working for you? Yep. Do you think mommy is there? How, you know, a great question to ask a child is, how can mommy love you better? You ask a child that question and you make it safe for them to tell you because a lot of children want to protect the parents. They want to make you feel safe, so which is not their responsibility. So when you get to the point where you can make it really safe, that's when kids will tell you everything that you did that hurt them, that pissed them off, that they resent. And then you have a chance to talk about it and it doesn't stay in the shadow. You can bring it to the light and work on it and talk about it. But it's really important and that just involves a lot of different things. But the I biggest agree, thing yeah. is um, is staying, uh, staying curious mm -hmm. and always looking for every avenue that you can learn, including your children. There's, it might so, sound like a contradiction of, of bringing in other people's feedback and what I said before, which is don't don't make all your decisions uh, on a reaction based on feeling judged. You actually feel more judged when you don't know what other pe people's opinions are. You feel more judged when you haven't checked in with a feedback. So it's actually, those two things are actually the way, like getting feedback, actually asking for feedback from your children and from, like you said, those you trust, is actually the way to not respond from feeling judged. We feel the most mm -hmm. judged when we don't know how people feel and they're just like looking at us. That's when we imagine mm -hmm. judgment. So the best way to come from a place that's self-directed and not from a place of reacting to judgment is checking in and getting that feedback. And here's a good here's a good hack. The minute you feel rigid about something where you feel like this is the right way, any parent is feeling that, that usually is a really good indication to lean back and go, how do I know that's really true? Mm -hmm. How do I know for sure that what I'm doing is right? And if in that moment, because I feel that someone's rigidity to any one belief system is an indicator that they're not loose, they're not open to maybe there's a different perspective. I mean, I remember way back when 
the assumption that a child can hold their head up it takes like a month for them to have muscular control was just something I accepted because in the West a child doesn't have muscular control until about a month whereas Ugandan women in three days they have perfect neck control and that they can navigate simply because they're attached to the mother and their skin at all moments in time while the mother is doing work so right there we go of course the kid can't hold his neck hold his neck up but until we actually go out into the world and go, I don't know everything, mm -hmm. and I might be wrong, mm -hmm. if we keep that mindset as a parent, all of us, mm -hmm. we have a much greater chance of finding ways that are healing and nourishing at the way to come at our children. Because you're right, all of our children are different, different things are going to work, they have different personality types, different modalities, Marianne was talking about as well, um, different types of learners, but at least we're coming at it with uh, as wide-eyed and as broad thinking as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what you do. You find what you feel and what you think it's working, uh, whatever makes sense, um, whatever feels right, and you just stick with it. And you go with it until it needs to be changed. If it doesn't work anymore, you change it. You inc incorporate something else. You um, go around a different way. And um, when it comes to judgment, um, I always come from myself so that I don't judge. I, because I feel if I don't judge somebody else, even if somebody else is judging me, I'm not going to be you know, susceptible to that. So um, I would always like when I see somebody doing something that I don't necessarily agree, I would just say, well, good for them, not for me. And that immediately deflates any kind of judgment that was, you know, starting to boil. And, um, you know, in a way you don't even, you know, bring it up on yourself. Um, so I think this was a great conversation, ladies. That's great stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was awesome. Great topic. Lots to talk about. We probably could talk about it all day if you gave us a chance. But uh, that's it for this episode today. Thanks for watching. Grow Great Live, and we'll see you next time.